Hi guys, uh, welcome. This is iRebel. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Um, we're on the Voluntary Virtues Network and we'd like to thank Mike Shanklin for that. Um, so, um, hi Sarah. Hi Meredith, good morning. And we're just going to dive right in. Uh, so today we kind of we have an important conversation and we wanted to talk about uh, this conversation that's going on regarding marketing liberty. It's uh, going around a lot lately. Um, so the interest in and understanding of the philosophy of liberty is growing. And that's awesome. Uh, and more and more people are joining us daily and each one brings with them a new perspective which is also awesome. Uh, but liberty is a thing, the one thing that people in power must beat back at all costs and they do this on all fronts. So therefore when marketing liberty we should strive to be precise in our words and our thoughts in order to steer clear of traps that are laid out before us. Um, I'm sure there are more but I, in this conversation I wanted to focus on three of these traps that have a great potential to undermine our cause and these three are collectivism, moralizing and bigotry and they're sometimes hard to spot and unfortunately are ingrained into all of our thinking. Um, collectivism sacrifices our individuality and moralizing sacrifices our compassion and our growth and bigotry sacrifices our rationality. Uh, you know, can't really be rational <laughs> when you're bigoted. So, uh, you know, in short, um, when we're talking, when we're marketing liberty, we don't actually need special language to talk to special groups uh, because liberty is for everyone. So, um, you know, first we wanted to start off with this because this is sort of where the conversation is happening and, uh, you know, I know this is sort of a touchy subject and everybody's got their opinion, but we're going to talk about thick and thin libertarianism. Um, and our contention is that we are all both. Uh, so maybe this conversation needs to be had about thick and thin libertarianism, but um, I'm keeping in mind anyway that each libertarian is is both. Um, so when we're talking about the thick and thin libertarianism, it's in reference to an article by Charles Johnson, and it's called Libertarianism Through Thick and Thin. And uh, most of us listening to this are familiar with the piece, so we won't go over it here. But if you haven't read it, definitely check that out. Um, and we were wondering, you and I, if we're looking at this maybe, if we're, if we're looking at this in the wrong way as voluntarists, right, the, the voluntarists in general, looking at this in the wrong way. Um, it, and is thick actually more restrictive than thin? Um, because there's this general idea that if we're, if we're adding these, uh, these different points to our core message, that that's inclu more inclusive, that's going to bring in more people. But it seems to me, when we're thinking about this and fleshing it out, that uh, a thick libertarianism would be more restrictive um, because we all have issues that we tend to focus on. So, for example, uh, intolerance, travel, technology, religion, healthcare, education, um, you might be someone who wants to help the poor or wants to end war. You might care about environmental issues, parenting, child abuse, circumcision, banking, food, Bitcoin, agorism, history, science, um, corrupt business practices, which is a big one, mm -hmm. uh, entrepreneurship, trade, and at literally everything else and even some things that haven't been invented yet. So... Um, in this way, we're all thick libertarians and voluntarists. Um, but when we infuse any of these issues, or any of our personal moral issues, with the message of liberty, um, we not only change the philosophy, but we crowd out those who have a differing opinion. Uh, so if our goal 
which we always have to keep in mind. If our goal is tolerance and inclusivity and reaching as many people as we can, then I think it's more wise to stick with the core message when marketing um, the philosophy of liberty. So uh, I know I'm, I'm talking a lot at the beginning here, but just a minute longer. Um, so uh, Walter Block has an essay titled Libertarianism and Libertinism, and in which he defines libertarian philosophy like this. He says, libertarianism is a political philosophy. It is concerned solely with the proper use of force. Its core premise is that it should be illegal to threaten or initiate violence against a person or his property without his permission. Force is justified only in defense or retaliation. That is it in a nutshell. The rest is mere explanation, elaboration, and qualification, and answering misconceived objections. So uh, this is an interesting essay. Um, I, I recommend people check it out, or maybe not, because uh, wh you know whatever you want to do. But uh, in the essay, he states his personal moral convictions. Um, so he talks about what libertarian what libertarianism is, and then goes into his moral convictions, which is a separate issue, which is his point. Um, but reading this, you know, I love Walter Blog, but I totally disagree with a lot of what he what he thinks is immoral. I a lot of the stuff that he thinks is immoral or perverse, I don't. Um, and he, you know, he even goes into lamenting parts of his his books, um, Defending the Undefendable. So this is interesting and it's I saw this as a really good example of why it's important to stay on point because if Walter Block had led with his moral convictions I wouldn't uh, I don't know that I would be on the same page with him or that I, I would he would be as effective at, at spreading the message of liberty as he is. Um, yeah, wow. <laughs> right. That's really interesting. Um, so I want to add that when we're talking about um, th this thick and thin issue and marketing liberty, I see people promise things through liberty, which I don't know that you can, and I think Walter Block points this out perfectly because you don't agree with all of his moral convictions, and that's okay, and you can talk about that. But you have to first understand the beginning and how he comes through liberty. Uh, and I think it's dangerous if people are promising a certain outcome from liberty on a specific issue. We don't know. We may all, we will all definitely be more equal in authority over ourselves. But whether that, what we should probably do here is define equal. Uh, but also, I want to say that. What I think we can say is that we would have a more equilibrium throughout society uh, versus equality. So I want to define those two words quickly um, as a basis of this. So equilibrium versus equality. Equilibrium is a state of rest or balance due to the equal action of opposing forces or equal balance between any powers, influences, etc. Equality of effect. The definition of equality, the state or quality of being equal, correspondence in quality, quantity, degree, value, rank, or ability. So right there, I, we won't necessarily all have the same ability. So I think it's dangerous if you're promising a certain outcome of equality through liberty. Right. And I, so I want to just go over a couple of important beginning points for the philosophy of liberty. Um, the voluntarist philosophy as a logical proof as opposed to a moral code. Mm -hmm. And if you're not familiar with this well-written text as a logical proof called The Philosophy of Liberty by Jonathan Gullible, um, there's a great video and then there's a text and we'll put a link to that at the bottom of this video. I think most people have probably seen it, but we'll put a link in case you haven't. Um, but it's just, a, it's a really easily understandable logical proof of the voluntarist philosophy. Um, 
So what does liberty bring? Liberty can provide a lens for anyone to view the world through. When an individual understands that liberty as a philosophy simply means the understanding and acceptance of the non-aggression principle or the proper and improper use of force, liberty provides us an antivirus for the mind. A person can begin to eliminate contradictions in their thinking. Mm -hmm. I love that. that it, it really is an antivirus and I like the use of that. And uh, So later on we're going to go into um, you know how it helps clear up faulty thinking. But um, So first I want to say what liberty brings or you know my version um, and I feel like liberty, liberty paves the way for all people to live their lives and to innovate and to create and to solve problems great and small in the way that they choose uh, without asking permission or fear of punishment for victimless actions so we need uh, we need this clearing of the way before we can even address any of the issues that that I mentioned earlier um, or equality or whatever we can't get there unless we first have liberty which is another reason why it's important that we stay on point when marketing these ideas um, so I, I wanted to uh, I'm kind of a fan of of the Dao uh, the Dao Di Ching by Lao Tzu um, I don't know if anybody else is familiar with that, but it's pretty cool. Um, so I wanted to read a little passage from that because um, this goes into, this is pertinent to what we're talking about. So it's chapter two of the Tao, and it says, when the world knows beauty as beauty, ugliness arises. When it knows good as good, evil arises. Thus, being and non-being produce each other, Difficult and easy bring about each other. Long and short reveal each other. High and low support each other. Music and voice harmonize each other. Front and back follow each other. Therefore, the sages manage the work of detached actions, conduct the teaching of no words. They work with myriad things but do not control. They create but do not possess. They act but do not presume which is important, they mm -hmm. succeed but do not dwell on success and it is because they do not dwell on success that it never goes away. So that's beautiful. Um, we could probably take apart that whole passage but I don't want to do that right here. I'm just going to sort of focus on these two first two lines um, which is when the world knows beauty as beauty ugliness arises and when it knows good as good evil arises so that means that our goal is to get people to see what ugliness is right? because at mm -hmm. the moment they don't know that they don't know mm -hmm. what evil is and when you define those things or beauty I mean you can do it either way right when you define right. what when you clarify what is good and what is evil um, and in, in our cases this is defining the use of force right mm -hmm. when, when a person understands that these things arise you can see it's it's it makes things clear in your head um, what is beauty what is ugly what is good and what is bad um, so I just wanted to stick that in there because I thought it was relevant and I love that that the whole chapter in the book mm -hmm. so yeah. yes so in that theme what is our goal as voluntarists mm -hmm. so David Gordon writes in the introduction to egalitarianism as a revolt against nature by Rothbard Rothbard points out that philosophy is a guide for action. In Why Be Libertarian, Rothbard asks the basic question of all. Why should libertarian theorizing matter to us? Why care about liberty? The answer cannot be found, he contends, in the narrow pursuit of individual advantage. Only the love of justice suffices. Mm -hmm. And I completely agree with him in that. Mm -hmm. It is a love of justice. Um, so I wanted to add my point to that because uh, right now we live in a society based 
on forced compliance. That's the basis of our society. Uh, and our goal is to help people to understand that so that we may create instead a society that is based on voluntary interactions. And that's a big difference. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to end central control and central planning and to recognize the authority that each one of us has over our own lives. And this, in this way, we will push humanity forward in great strides and it's what's needed to solve all of the problems before mm -hmm. us. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to change, our goal is to change the basis of our society and, and all the actions that we take. Right, right. And I, I love that he says the only love, only the love of justice suffices because you don't even have to um, experience something yourself to understand that somebody else might be experiencing an injustice and, and still know that it's important to realize that. Right, yeah. And, um, you know, also that the answer cannot be found, he contends, in the narrow pursuit of individual advantage, which I think is a big misconception that people have about libertarians, that we're just, you know, we just want to pursue our own individual advantage no matter, you know, that's the only thing we're worried about. Right. So. Which is really, really off, because if if that were true, well, we might as we might just as well be politicians. That's actually what people do now today and uh, mm -hmm. I don't know who somebody pointed this out the other day that if libertarians really wanted to be if their if their goal was really self-interest if that's what they really you know wanted then a lot of them are successful uh, why don't they just do what you know why would they sacrifice their success or their potential to, to have more success in their own personal lives to pursue justice. That doesn't make any sense. Um, it really is the love of justice for all. It's, it's empathy, mm -hmm. it's compassion for your fellow human beings. It's, you know, wanting to change things for the better, for right. everyone. Right. And I just want to re re reiterate what you said. Um, recognizing the authority that each one of us has over our own lives. Mm -hmm. So I think sometimes that gets misconstrued as pursuing your individual advantage, but it's just understanding that, right. the authority over yourself. And the e that, that's the equality. Yes, that is the equality. So we, we are in pursuit of one particular type of equality, and that is equality of authority. Um, but all the rest, no, that's, we are looking for equilibrium, not mm -hmm. equality. And there's mm -hmm. a difference there. Right. So, voluntary philosophy helps clear up faulty thinking, which has nothing to do with intelligence. Right. And once we as individuals understand and see the state violence, we begin to see and understand the solutions that are already here or work to improve those solutions. When people are viewing the world through the lens of the state, the elegant solutions that exist right alongside the state are invisible or viewed as illegal or scary or risky. Take Bitcoin, for example. Um, through the state's lens, it appears as a huge problem, possibly illegal. Rather than a means of exchange to bank the unbanked of the world, provide the opportunity for anyone to transact with anyone for pennies across oceans. So I think it's really important if and I know for myself, once I saw what the real problems were, all the solutions that are happening now alongside work are, are much more easily viewable for me personally. Yes. Yeah. I mean, and it, that's a huge marketing point for voluntarist philosophy. Absolutely, because you know you're wondering what voluntary uh, what volunteerism can do for you. Well, that's just the first perk is that it clears up your thinking, which is wonderful. It helps in all aspects of life. Um, so, about that, I wanted to say that uh, once one realizes that the line of acceptable behavior is crossed when one uses aggression as a means to an end, uh, the way to view issues and make choices, whether they're personal or global, becomes clear. So, we, we are no longer in an us versus them mentality which is very destructive and we're no longer lured by emotional propaganda 
that, which is all around us, and people fall into these traps all the time. Um, and speaking of which, I have a short, uh, I have a story about this. So to, to illustrate my point, um, I had a conversation with my daughter just a, like, about a week ago, and she's 14. And in her world, feminism is widely discussed. It's it's all the rage with the teens. It's um, kind of all the rage with everybody. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I I I, I talked to her about that too, but that's for a different time. So, um, but one day she was lamenting about this rape culture thing that we live in a rape culture, and I didn't I didn't quite know what she meant. So I asked her to define it, right? And keep in mind, I'm not judging her, and I'm not trying to tell her what to think. I'm trying to help her um, to think clearly for herself. Uh, so she named a few things that she felt were part of rape culture. And two of those things were catcalling by men um, and then cultural expectations that women be modestly dressed. So she's saying that I don't like catcalling. They shouldn't do that. And women should be able to dress however they want, including topless, right, like they do in Europe. Um, mm -hmm. which I don't have a problem with. Uh, maybe Walter Block does. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, so, uh, so I didn't disagree with her, and I didn't, you know, tell her she's wrong. Um, I just pointed out that first of all, neither catcalling nor the way people dress has anything to do with violence or force. Um, and so we have to keep that in mind when we're thinking about this. And and then wanting to end catcalling was restricting the freedom of men while at the same time wanting women to dress in the way that they choose was expanding the freedom for women. So in other words, they're opposite sides of the spectrum and she didn't she didn't know that previously. She didn't she hadn't thought about it in that way. Um, and I wouldn't have either if I didn't know this stuff, right? This would have just right. I had too. So this helps us to organize our thoughts in this way. Um, and it helped her to organize her thoughts too. So it shed new light on issues for her. And I've noticed since then, because she's still talking about this, um, she's been able to think much more clearly about the conversations that take place around her, and she's changed her mind on certain things. And it was interesting. I saw her, you know, thinking about this and really taking it to heart, um, and and I loved that. So that's a really good way to show how the volunteer's philosophy can help clear up your thinking, no matter what. That's a beautiful example. Mm -hmm. And it was between you and your daughter. Right. And I think that brings us to our next point, which is about empathy. Um, and I think you ex you modeled empathy for your daughter, and spoke to her without being judgment judgmental or undermining her ideas. Uh, everybody's at different levels of thinking and learning, and different layers of awareness or being exposed to different ideas. And so. Um, does volunteerism require empathy? And I think it does. I think if we understand that the individual is the smallest minority, we can each understand that our experience is as important as anyone else's. And in order to cooperate and find solutions to problems, it is most helpful to imagine yourself in other situations. So I think you probably did that. You put yourself in your daughter's shoes, essentially, and how she was thinking about that. Um, and this works, too, in understanding how to help individuals understand liberty. Also, when talking about liberty, empathy for another's cognitive dissonance can help break down the barrier to real understanding. Yeah, which is important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that brings us to our next point very eloquently, which is do we need special languages to appeal to special groups? Yeah. So this is definitely part of the conversation um, that I see, and I see both sides of the conversation. I'm sure most of the people listening to this, unless you're, um, if you're new to volunteerism, welcome. Like we're we're really happy to that you're listening to us, and if you're not, we're really happy you're listening to us too. But um, you know, I think a lot of the people that are listening are already volunteerists, and they're seeing this co this conversation happening too. And um, I just wanted to weigh in on this. And I was telling you, you and I were talking about this, and I, uh, 
It's funny because we've been listening to Thaddeus Russell on the School Sucks Project podcast, and um, we're both loving it. Every time he's on, you know, I'm cheering. Mm -hmm. Um, and he's got a perspective. It's new. And I very much respect it and relate to it. Uh, I've noticed that a lot of other people in the School Sucks Project audience have been upset by some of the things that he said. But I feel like I get it. I'm, he hasn't upset me at all. It just made me think and really helped me fill in some gaps. Um, and I've read his book because of this, uh, which is A Renegade History of the United States. And I totally recommend it to everyone. Get it. Read it. Um, and he speaks of how harmful moralizing is, and he does a good job at, at explaining that, and I, I agree with him. And I feel like his message is really very similar to what Larkin Rose says in his book, The Most Dangerous Superstition, also um, a highly recommended book. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I don't know if anybody's noticed that, uh, but I have. It's very, what he's saying might not look at, like it on the surface, but when you compare the two, they're very similar messages. Um, yeah, I'm glad you pointed that out to me because I hadn't noticed that, but clearly it, see it. Yes, right. They're both saying it's in the mind. We're not going to get to to the. We're not going to reach our goal unless each person understands these things in their own mind, um, because that's where the state lives, and mm -hmm. not in Washington. <laughs> In the heads of everyone. So uh, that's why it's important to keep moralization in check. Um, and, you know, however, <laughs> <laughs> I'm loving Thaddeus Russell. I think he's great. But he posted something on Facebook the other day that I just was like, oh, my goodness, I couldn't ignore it um, because it's moralizing. And, um, and it's, I don't know if he knows this. Maybe. I don't know. Uh, mm -hmm. but, he's, but this is. A part of the ongoing conversation about marketing liberty um, and I'll read it and you can see why um, oh I just as a side note put the side note in here <laughs> if you're anybody if you're a teen if you're a parent an autodidact a volunteerist a libertarian history buff or anybody who enjoys a well-crafted entertaining and informative podcast then both Sarah and I Really recommend checking out School Sucks podcast. Uh, School Sucks Pro School Sucks Project podcast. It's by yes. Brent Vinat. He's so awesome. It's how you and I met. It's the greatest. It is. Maybe we'll tell that story one day. But we're right. the super fans. We are definitely. If you couldn't tell. So um, now, uh, Thaddeus Russell posted this, but he did not write it. Um, so he's quoting somebody else. Uh, so I'll read it. So it goes, questions for libertarians. On average, how many times is it necessary for you to tell a low-income single mother that taxation is theft before she voluntarily stops accepting any government aid and graciously allows her child to go without medical care and starve to death for liberty? Now this is clearly snarky. Uh, <laughs> and... You know, I read all the comments. There were tons. It generated lots of lots of comments mm -hmm. on both sides, um, which is kind of what we're talking about. And uh, I want to break this down. So the, the, what I see, first and foremost, is this is a straw man argument because the state's not going to dissolve because people stop accepting welfare. Um, and it, honestly, I've never met anyone or read anything that makes that claim. I don't think there is anybody. Well, okay. I mean... There are lots of people and they think lots of things, but if they thought that they'd be wrong, the state won't dissolve because people stop accepting welfare. Um, and it, it, you know, I, also it takes time and thought for anyone, single mother on welfare or not, to understand this philosophy. It, it's a lot of years. I mean, it, it took me years. It takes people years. Um, and looking at different aspects at different times and listening to different people, it's, you know, it's a big thing. And um, also, most voluntarists uh, take no issue with people receiving state benefits. Uh, and this is because there's an understanding that many have no other choice. I mean, we all use the roads. We all drive on government you know, roads using our government-issued licenses. I really don't see a difference between that and receiving state benefits. And honestly, um, as just a, another side note, from my perspective, mm -hmm. uh, there might be economists in the crowd that know more about this than I do, but I see the state as, um, you know, they just take our money. 
right? They're just a group of people that likes to take the money from everybody else. And however we can get that money back into um, the society, our you know, our private economy, the better, right? And mm -hmm. even everybody pays taxes. Even welfare moms pay taxes. So I don't, you know, possibly, you know, it would help the state to fall faster if everybody were on welfare. That, yeah. <laughs> that's not what we have an issue with. So right off the bat, that's a straw man. Mm -hmm. um, and it comes from the dislike of the term taxation is theft. So it's it's based on a mindset that phrases like this are off-putting to certain demographics. You know, even if it's true, they don't they don't want you to say it. So this, along with other popular phrases such as "statism is slavery," "taxation is theft," and "statism mm -hmm. is slavery," um, they just think uh, the the certain this one side of the debate um, they think these phrases shouldn't be used. Um, so, and this goes along with another claim that runs through these circles, and it's one that asserts that some people, namely women, the poor, liberals, and minorities, need a kind of special language to understand or to take an interest in libertarian philosophy. And I just think that's not only untrue, but it's really insulting. Um, because uh, while we definitely need marketing, that's, that's you know, a plus on that one. Um, there are uh, many ways to say it, but the message is already beautiful and universal. Mm -hmm. um, it's something that everyone has the ability to understand, no matter where they are in life, no matter what demographic they are in. Um, so I think uh, I think this is based on uh, an assumption. I'm not sure, but it seems to me like okay. So if you're targeting uh, the poor and minorities and liberals, um, then the assumption is that the current voluntarist rhetoric is somehow right wing. Um, because <laughs> nobody ever says, you know, how are we going to market this to the conservatives? That's just not an issue. So it seems to me like there's an underlying thing here that, that, our, that our rhetoric is already right wing. I don't see that as the case. It, it's not. It, you know, in certain ways, it sounds like it, and maybe it's true that more people come from the right than from the left into voluntarist philosophy. Maybe who knows? Um, but that's. <clears throat> and you know, I know I'm talking on and on about this, uh, but just one more point. Oh, did you want to say something? No, I was going to clear my throat. Sorry. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> um, just one more point about this, and, and so empirically, I know empirical isn't, you know, used in scientific, you know, stuff, but I was raised by a liberal single mother on welfare, and then I grew up to become a liberal single mother on welfare, and I didn't need any special language to understand voluntarism. In fact, it might have turned me off. I, I came into it just the same way that other people do, and and I understood it just fine. And I like mm -hmm. the rhetoric. I like the message. I like the way it's portrayed, and in many different ways by many different people. I don't think I, I need any special language. Um, and I would just like to point out that whether you like the phrase or not, taxation is theft, and statism is slavery. So maybe the people who understand that are already voluntarists, but it's true. So, mm -hmm. you know, I mean... Mm -hmm. Yeah, and about the um, the idea that people might think that it's more conservative already, it's mm -hmm. a conservative message, I think that goes both ways. And I think maybe if you come from the liberal mindset, you might think it looks more conservative from the outside, and I think the vi that vice versa could apply too. If you're conservative and you hear the anti-war message, I'm imagining that it would look very liberal to you too. So I don't think that's valid at all. I mean, that's just somebody's initial um, view of it or, or impression of, of, of liberty. But I think, and if we can have empathy towards those views, we can reach them because then we can understand where they're coming from. And yes. their starting point, mm -hmm. which brings us to can we reach everyone? 
Good question. Yes. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest. Right. Um, however one comes to liberty or voluntarism, if it be a pet issue or moral ideal, uh, the most important concept to understand first is that all state power is wrong and a violation of the, NA of the NAP or the non-aggression principle. Once that is understood, there's room for conversation and fleshing out of ideas and solutions to the real problems we face as individuals, uh, acting in our own self-interest, including our morals. Uh, which is what Walter Block is talking about. Uh, liberty and the non-aggression principle and property rights do not guarantee a solution of equality or a perfect world. But when people understand these things and work and communicate within these ideas, there's room for persuasion and understanding and the opportunity to understand individual needs and wants. Um, so from a Rockwell article that I came across, uh, as Murray Rothbard, Mr. Libertarian himself once explained, there are libertarians who are indeed hedonists and devotees of the alternative lifestyle, and that there are also libertarians who are firm adherents to bourgeois, conventional, or religious morality. There are libertarian libertines, and there are libertarians who cleave firmly to the disciplines of natural or religious law. There are other libertarians who have no moral theory at all apart from the imperative of nonviolence, non-violation of rights. That is because libertarianism per se has no general or personal moral theory. Libertarianism does not offer a way of life. It offers liberty so that each person is free to adopt and act upon his own values and moral principles. Libertarians agree with Lord Acton that liberty is the highest political end, not necessarily the highest end on everyone's personal scale of values. Um, so your heaven may be my hell, and my hell may be your heaven. And I, in liberty, we can all find where we belong. Right. Yeah, I love that. And he does reiterate what Walter Block was saying, that this is not a moral theory. Um, you know, and I think it, it helps if we clear that up. And we each have our own morals. <laughs> it's, that's, that's fine. That's, and, and once we understand that, then we do have a greater chance of reaching everyone. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, by all means, talk to your own demographic. You know, get, right. get the word out. Right. Um, so I wanted to talk quickly about the non-aggression principle. Um, and is the subjectivity in the definition of aggression a bad thing? Because I think that might be so, that that is at the core of some of these arguments of the thick and thin. Yes. Um, and you know, I this is my personal thought um, that I can agree that the NAP is not perfect in defining all aggression, but it definitely defines the most egregious and widely defined aggression. But maybe it's good that it doesn't strictly define aggression. Because if it did, it might be easier to find ways around it. Yeah, and I, I mean, I definitely agree with that. Um, and this is sort of a revelation that was very new to me because I've been seeing this as a problem, right? And, and in conversations with fellow voluntarists, um, this is coming up. And not just conversations, but I've noticed it. I mean, some people say uh, bullying is a violation of the non-aggression principle. And others say, um, you know, by you, you know, th by following the non-aggression principle or through following the non-aggression pr aggression principle, that it justifies, you know, shooting government workers, right, or police. I mean, we, or whoever. Mm -hmm. uh, so these are different sides <clears throat> of the spectrum, and um, I mean, those are just two examples. There are many, many more where some you people could, even said shaming. Right. 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 So. It's, I've seen this as a problem this whole time, and and mm -hmm. I, just, you know, that we just talking through with you, Sarah, we realize that maybe that's the way we want it to be. We want that wiggle room in there, because each, you know, when when the conflict arises and you take it to an arbiter, you don't want that that rule to be so set in stone that. I mean, that's kind of what happens today. You don't want that to be so set in stone that people will, number one, find a ton of ways around it. And, um, you know, so they'll, 
like stalking, for instance, we were talking about that. Um, right. You know, I mean, they'll just being harassed or, or stalked. That actually doesn't really fall under the non-aggression principle, but that is a problem. So that's just one example of how you know these things need to need to have some leeway for individual cases, um, and so that all sides of the case can be heard and all of the um, individual pertinent information, all of the information about the case can be heard. Yes. Right, so that we can we can continue to to treat people like the individuals that they are, even in mm -hmm. cases of uh, conflict. Mm -hmm. So you know, maybe it's just that the non-aggression principle is, like you said, it outlines the most egregious, the things that we all agree that is mm -hmm. aggression. Murder is aggression. Theft is is aggression. All this stuff is definitely aggression. But right. The, right. The gray areas, you know, maybe we just need to leave them gray. Mm hmm Yeah. So you found a quote by Larkin Rose that we thought we would sum up and conclude our talk today with. Yeah. Well, we, you found it, too. We both found it. That's so, true. yeah, but we think it's a great conclusion. Um, mm -hmm. And hooray for Larkin Rose, honestly. Mm -hmm. So let me just read it. He says, um, while I'm all for in-depth philosophizing and nitpicking every concept and principle ad infinitum, the reality of the situation is that at least 95% of the world's problems can be solved simply by people sorting out their own heads and removing the contradictions. To fix most of what is wrong does not require adding anything new to people's heads. It requires removing one lie, the belief in authority. Most people already know everything they need to know and already have all the moral code they need to have to make society dramatically better than it is now. If they can only be brought to recognize and reject those superstitions and assumptions which go against the ability to reason and the moral judgment which they already possess. We don't need to have, have to convince evil people to be good. We don't have to convince stupid people to be smart. We only have to show people the superstition in their heads that is interfering with whatever level of intelligence and goodness that they already possess and duping them into unwittingly acting as enablers of evil. And remember, friends don't let friends accidentally advocate the enslavement of mankind. Thank you, Larkin Rose. So we are completely out of time. Yes. <laughs> but I really enjoyed this talk. Me too. And the, and the time that we spent fleshing out some of these ideas. Mm -hmm. So you can join us every Saturday morning from 7 to 7.30 uh, Eastern Standard Time on the Volunteers Virtues Network. And this has been iRebel. And we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you, Meredith. Bye-bye.